Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. We bring together patients, experts, and health advocates who are all here to help you optimize your health. Here's your host, Jacqueline Gollin. Hey, everyone. Uh, Welcome to the Gastro Girl Podcast. This episode is about a really interesting and important topic that doesn't get enough attention. It's the pelvic floor. And we are so fortunate to be joined today by two urogynecologists, Dr. Karen Elber of Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And the other is Dr. Victoria Scott, who's in private practice also in Los Angeles. Now they're both the authors of this fabulous book that I just got and I haven't gotten all the way through it, but it's a woman's guide to the pelvic floor. What the is going on down there? I love this. Every woman can relate to this. Um, And there's so much good stuff in here, Um, but we're going to focus today's episode on five things that women should know about the pelvic floor, because we want you to read this book. It's so important and enlightening. You will love it. I promise you. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Elbler and Dr. Scott. Thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations on your book. So exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. So first of all, before we get into the five things that Um, women should know about the pelvic floor. What is the pelvic floor and why is it so important to um, our bodies? All right, so the pelvic floor is a hammock of muscles and connective tissue, which support the core um, as well as the pelvic organs. So that includes the urethra, the bladder, the vagina, the uterus if you have one and the surrounding intestines. It plays a really important supportive role, but also functional role um, in helping women and men control the bodily functions. So specifically peeing, pooping, and having sexual intercourse. Great. So when, yeah, when your pelvic floor is functioning, you don't think about it, right? When it's not functioning, that's when you start having issues like involuntary loss of urine or of bowel movements, or sometimes women just have, or even men can have involuntary loss of say gas or flatus, which these things can be very embarrassing and distressing to people. Yeah. And, you know, we're coming you know, the pelvic floor relates to so many um, things that are going on in our bodies, but we're really going to kind of focus on how it relates to maybe some of those digestive health symptoms and conditions that may overlap, that may confuse patients on some of the pain, bloating, constipation, maybe some just weird things that they feel down there that they maybe think it's a digestive health issue, but it could be something related to the pelvic floor. So without uh, further delay, let's talk about five things that are the most important things that women need to know about the pelvic floor. So I'll let you start, Dr. Elbler. So I think one thing that's important for women to know is that it is normal to have changes of the pelvic floor and often significant changes after vaginal childbirth. So I do think that, and I'll probably be um, criticized by a lot of our gynecologic and obstetric colleagues, but we romanticize pregnancy and childbirth a lot. So that afterwards, when women don't function normally, they think there's something wrong with them because we tend to just focus on all the positive things, which are great. I mean, you're having a baby. It's this wonderful experience. But what a lot of women are totally blindsided by is that when you have a vaginal birth, you have tearing and stretching of these muscles and connective tissue that Dr. Scott referred to earlier. And these can cause things like involuntary loss of urine or stool or pain with intercourse. And because we don't discuss these things, a lot of our patients feel very alone and embarrassed and then don't even talk to their doctor about it. So they suffer with these problems for a long time, which is exactly what prompted us to write this book. And we also wrote it in a lighter tone so that you know, you're already having a hard time with it. So when you write it in more of a, hey, I'm talking to my girlfriend tone, it just makes it a little easier to discuss, I think. Yes. And that's really noticeable in some of the the names of the, actually all of the names of the chapters. Um, I I think uh, our audience will really love this book, the way it's structured. So um, Dr. Scott, what's another um, important fact that patients should know about the pelvic floor? Um, I think you brought up a good one and kind of tying together the bowel and the bladder issues. Um, So understanding that there's a lot going on down there. Um, And it can be really difficult to kind of identify, is it what hurts? Is it my bladder? Is it my, is it my rectum? Is it my intestines? Is it my vagina? Um, So understanding that it is is a really complicated place. um, And there's a lot of, you know, support. There's a lot of function that we have to think about fixing for patients. 
Um, so understanding that it's complicated um, and I think seeking help early rather than later from doctors uh, or from our book to try and understand uh, what's going on down there um, is, is helpful. So let's pause for a bit and kind of take what you both said, the, the first two um, important facts, and what can our, our readers expect to find in the book? Like what kind of answers can we expect to find that address both of those things that you said, you know, after childbirth, being afraid to talk about it, it's embarrassing, the pain that you're feeling and not knowing, you know, where it's coming from and how do I address that? Who do I go to? Who do I talk to? I think you just nailed it on the head. First of all, most women don't even know where to go. Yeah. They don't realize actually doctors who and physical therapists who specialize in the pelvic floor. So I think one of the most important things to walk away from the book is who to go to see. And another thing is that these problems can be fixed. You may not be, you know, back 100% to normal, but these things can be improved. And, you know, since I practice in Beverly Hills, I always use an analogy even if you have a perfect facelift, you don't look like you were when you were 18 again, but you are a lot better. And it's the same with if you have injury to the pelvic floor because of childbirth or any other issues, you might not be perfect, but there certainly can be help. And so, you know, I think both Dr. Scott and I and our other co-author, Dr. Anger, we just felt really frustrated for these women who they took a long time before they ever got to see us. And I think dealing with these problems for a long time and losing hope, you know, we really want to just give them, you know, their hope back and then knowing that they could get better. And and they're not alone, right? This is pretty common. You see this a lot, correct? In your practices? Yeah. I mean, statistically speaking, um, and Dr. Scott can correct me, like one 11 women will have surgery for like incontinence or prolapse in her lifetime. And then a significant proportion of these will have a reoperation because it's just like having like a hernia. You know, it's your tissue is weak. And so even though you fix it, there's going to be a certain percent of people because of their weak tissue might have a repeat problem. But this is absolutely common. And this is our both of our full time practices. That's great. And the other thing I loved about your book, and again, I haven't finished the whole thing because I just got it, is you do great graphics. Like a lot of us don't even know our own body and anatomy. And you do you know, you, you you make light of the fact that you actually have three holes down there, ladies. Um, you may not, I, I mean, I laughed out loud when I read this. I mean, it sounds so simplistic, but it's really important because we forget that there's a lot of stuff happening down there and things are intertwined, which makes it really hard sometimes, like I'm going to keep saying this, to know what that discomfort is is really originating from. Is it you know, do I just have a GI? Do I have IBS? Do I have something else going on? Um, but the pelvic floor, I think, needs some love and attention. Um, and that's why I'm so excited when I saw that you you wrote this book, both of you. And But your diagrams are fantastic. Um, is there anything in the book that you feel like uh, is your favorite that women should really pay attention to? Like, is there, you know, something that they should really hone in on at the beginning? Just coming back to Dr. Albert's point that so many of these pelvic floor disorders and issues are so common, um, that's truly our main motivation in writing the book to help women realize, hey, we're all going through this. Um, don't feel alone or ashamed or embarrassed. Bring it up to your, your moms, your girlfriends. Um, talk to them about, about these issues, urinary incontinence, leaking urine, um, pain with sex, urinary tract infections, pelvic pain, all these things are so common amongst women. We just don't talk about them. So I know we're on our number three important thing. Can we make this about some of the GI symptoms that they may present as a GI issue, constipation, bloating, diarrhea, abdo lower abdominal pain? What should women know about how this relates to the pelvic, pelvic floor? And how do they know, do they go to a GI doctor? Do they go to their primary care? Or do they look for someone like you, a urogynecologist? You bring up a, a great point. And I just saw a woman yesterday where there is a lot of overlap. So the answer to your question earlier of who do you see, it's yes, yes, and yes. So, <laughs> you know, depending on where you start, you usually end up seeing sometimes multiple specialists because they do all overlap. And although I work with my colorectal and GI colleagues a lot, I would never be so bold as to assume I know what they're going to say. Right. So for instance, I saw a young woman yesterday. So maybe this could be number three okay. is 
weakening and damage of the pelvic floor can cause problems, but you can also have problems from the pelvic floor muscles being too tight. So this is where we can sometimes see a lot of defecatory or difficulty moving your oh, bowels and chronic constipation. So whether you're trying to go number one or number two, it doesn't matter how normal your bladder or maybe your bowel contractility is. If you cannot relax the outlet, you cannot empty out whatever contents you have. So we see a lot of women who maybe have um, endometriosis or other chronic pelvic pain conditions, and it is the normal reflex of the body. If you have pain, you're gonna contract your muscles. So if you are chronically contracting your pelvic muscles, when it's time to normally relax them, say when you wanna move your bowels, it becomes not possible. And so people get what they call dysynergia. So you have this, you're trying to go and yet you can't relax the anal sphincter or sometimes urinary sphincter. And so you have actually difficulty going number one and number two. And that overlap, like Dr. Scott was referring to is because the bladder and the bowel also share the same nerves. Oh, wow. That's a really good number three. And I think uh, a lot of our GI patients experience uh, situations like that where they're, and then they're on a, if without, you know, finding out that it's a pelvic floor issue, they're on that constant rotation of laxative abuse, right? And we see that over and over and over again. We've done numerous episodes with GI motility experts. And one of them finally said the pelvic floor, <laughs> you know, if you're not getting relief, it is time to like look at something else. So I'm glad you brought that up and, it, and, and you go into that in the book and that's so important. Number four, what is a, a number, the next important, I know all of this is important, but we we want folks to read this book because it's so good. What is, you, what is your number four pick for what patients should know or women should know? Ah, Dr. Scott's on the hip because I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we wanted to do another GI focused um, kind of number four, I think it would be that fecal incontinence is really an unfortunately overlooked um, symptom and, pro and public floor problem for patients. You know, people don't think of us as seeing more of the issues with going, you know, having bowel movements. Um, but we, as Dr. Albert mentioned, there's a lot of overlap. Many women up to 35 to 50% of women with urinary incontinence may also have fecal incontinence. And as the, you know, the urogynecologists, they present to us with the urinary incontinence, but we also always ask about um, defecatory dis issues and they say, hey, yeah, I'm actually really bothered by, by fecal incontinence. No one's asked me about it. I kind of mentioned it to my gastroenterologist. I got a little bit of counseling about dietary changes, behavioral changes, but that hasn't helped and can you help me? Um, so I think it's, it ends up being a little bit overlooked and we have, we don't have great options necessarily. Um, but one thing that to keep in mind that as, um, urogynecologists, we can offer one great, um, therapy that's pretty minimally invasive. So if the conservative things haven't helped, um, there's something called neuromodulation, which we use for urinary incontinence as well. and can be very helpful for fecal incontinence. Can we back up a little bit? I, I, you raise a really important point about fecal incontinence. It doesn't get talked about a lot. I think patients are afraid to talk about it too. In the GI world, we had um, the annual scientific meeting in October. And one of um, the studies, actually there were a couple of them. And they talked about how doctors weren't asking their IBD patients if they have any issues with um, fecal incontinence. And they were embarrassed to say the doctors in this study. And I talked to, and actually she used to work at Cedar sinai Dr. Mala Davinsky, we did an episode with her and she spoke about, they never knew that their IBD patients were wearing diapers at times because they were so afraid of having an accident. So I say that because I, I really want your help in defining for us, what fecal incontinence is. People understand urinary, you know, there's a leak here and there, but you know, it, when is it an issue that patients should go to the doctor for? Like what, what should be bothersome and should make them seek help? You know, I will have patients come, whether it's for fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, and they say, am I a candidate to fix this? Well, if you're bothered, yes, it doesn't have to be like a minimum of three diapers a day. You know, it's, and there's also there is anal incontinence, which you involuntarily lose either gas 
or stool. And then fecal incontinence typically you know, is loss of actually stool itself. So there are some people where they're not necessarily losing actual form stool, but they're passing gas all the time. And if you're working in a small office, you know, that's really embarrassing and distressing to people. Wow. Well, that's a really good point. I'm, I'm glad. And I hope our listeners take that advice and, you know, look at their situations and seek help and not be afraid to think that it's not a big deal. Because if, like Dr. Eller said, if it's, if, if you're uncomfortable and it's bothering you, no matter what you're measuring it at, if it's bothering you, it's impacting your life, then you should seek help for it. So I thank you for saying that. Our listeners hopefully will really take heed and, and take action. I know this is a big one. This is number five. So I'm going to give you both a number five. How's that sound? <laughs> Great. Another competition. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I mean, you. there's so much good stuff in here. I, I mean, it's phenomenal. Um, you know what I, 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 I'm really interested in all the stuff about the hormones and how that plays into what's going on and people, uh, women who are going through change of changes of life. You know, let's talk a little bit about that. I'm, I'm going to kind of kind of steer you in that number five direction, if you don't mind, because I think that also gets overlooked. And there's a lot of things that could be happening that we're not aware of. And you know, seeking help for that could could help hopefully help some of these issues that we're experiencing. I'll go back to your question earlier about like what was the favorite diagram? Yeah. My favorite diagram is the boring one that actually shows the hormonal cycle. Yeah. It's very basic. And yet this is something that we do not routinely teach, you know, young women and women as they move through the different hormonal phases in their life. You know, and so bloating right? Like bloating invariably is either a GI problem or it's hormonal, right? Like we see, we get referred a lot of women for, you know, their bladder, like UTIs, like urinary tract infections causing bloating, but that doesn't cause bloating. Like number one and number two, it's either GI. And I do, and you've probably seen this, Jackie, people go crazy with their probiotics and you oh, don't God, realize yeah. That, you know, trying to be healthy sometimes and not being guided in the right direction, that taking things like probiotics can actually make more gas and make you more bloated. Yeah. Or, hey, I don't get it. I, I changed my birth control or my menstrual cycles are changing and I feel like I'm gaining a lot of weight. And it's like, you're actually not gaining weight. You're just bloated because your hormones are changing. And I, I find it ironic that we write off a lot of things due to hormones that aren't like no, I'm not in a bad mood because my hormones are changing. I'm in a bad mood because you're just being an a-hole. Um, and then we don't attribute enough things to hormonal changes. Like, why am I bloated all the time? Why am I constipated all the time now? Yes. So what is your advice for um, for women who, you know, when should they address those hormone issues? Like, and look at your, read your book and look at the cycles and maybe talk to their doctor, see where they are. But I'll let you answer that. I, mean, I think, again, it goes back to when you're bothered. You know, there are some women who, and I think it's more the exception than the rule, who become, you know, perimenopause or menopausal and except for stopping having their period, they don't really miss a beat. Like they don't really have any symptoms. And there are women who are barely having any hormonal changes and they are miserable. They can't sleep. They can't concentrate. So I think that when you have symptoms that are bothersome that you think may be attributed to hormonal changes, that is when you talk to your doctor. And another, you know, maybe this is 5A, um, don't let your doctor, you know, kind of gaslight you or just kind of blow off your symptoms. I, I do think that a lot of women feel, I think this book will validate a lot of women's concerns that they haven't told, oh, don't worry about it. You know, just relax. It's all in your head. So I think that, you know, if I have to end with my, my number 5A, we'll let Dr. Scott do 5B. <laughs> it's, you know, seek help when it bothers you. And if you're not satisfied with the response or if no one is offering you any kind of help, go somewhere else, right? Like if you have a bad haircut, you go somewhere else. If you, if you don't get a good medical, you know, advice, go seek somewhere else. I love this. And we've had numerous patients on our podcast who have advocated, who've like done everything uh, to get the results that they want and they know they deserve. So thank you for saying that, you know, it's great to hear it from a physician saying that for to a patient, you know, don't stop. Like you keep trying, right. That's so important. Well, listen, I'm old enough. I've also been a patient and I have had the pleasure of having the most wonderful, thoughtful, intelligent doctors. And I've also gone to doctors that I didn't bother going back to. 
No, that's so great to hear. That is from you so that patients know that they're not stuck with just the doctor that they went to. You have options and you it's in your control. So thank you. Now, da 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 da. We're going to go in five. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so 5B, along with the hormone theme, I think it's important for patients to remember that, you know, we think about perimenopause and menopause as the prime times where hormone changing hormones are impacting our lives. Um, but also, even when we're postmenopausal, um, we're going to be feeling, you know, new, new causes or new problems that occur from decreasing hormone levels. Um, so, for example, vaginal dryness, genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Um, I think patients get really confused when we say, well, this, you know, dryness in the vagina, pain with intercourse, it's due to decreasing estrogen levels impacting the vaginal tissue. Um, and they say, well, I went through menopause 20 years ago. Why is this affecting me now? Well, actually, you know, again, the decrease in hormone levels are impacting your body, even in the postmenopausal era. So don't neglect hormonal changes as, um, you know, the causes of some of your pelvic floor issues, even 10, 20, 30 years after menopause. So the so your even if you've never had a child, your hormones can impact your pelvic floor. Is that correct? Absolutely. And just age. And just age. Like all muscles you know, get weaker with age. Yeah. So and, muscle. Well, so let's get back to, even if a woman's never had a vaginal delivery, let's say, and this is not an uncommon scenario, we will see a young woman, early twenties, okay, who has um, like her, not necessarily her bladder falling, but her uterus can be falling and her rectum can be falling like, you know, rectal prolapse. And the first thing you ask her is how long you've been constipated. Because if you're sitting, pushing on the toilet every day, you can do just as much damage as having a couple of vaginal deliveries. That is such a good point. Thank you for saying that. But this is this is so interesting. Oh, God, I could keep going on and on with the questions, but I want you, you all to read this book. As we sum up, what do you want to say in closing? Um, tips or guidance for patients? And I'll give you both the opportunity to, to say um, your final thoughts about what patients need to know, what your recommendations are. So Dr. Elber? Patients need to know, just like you mentioned earlier, pelvic floor issues are so common. There are people out there like Dr. Scott, our other co-author, Dr. Anger, myself, who specialize in urogynecology. We work very close with our GI and colorectal colleagues. So although not everybody has such severe issues that they need like all specialties helping out, there are people to help out. So there is no reason to put up with symptoms that you are not happy with. Thank you. That's so important. Dr. Scott? Along those lines of remembering how common these issues are and seeking help from your doctors, we really want to encourage women to seek help from their the women around them, um, from their friends, from their family members. The more we talk about these issues, the more we're going to learn from each other and normalize them so women feel more comfortable bringing them up. Well, I... I'm so impressed with you both. This book, I can't wait to finish it. Like I said, it's really, really, really good. Um, we're going to put the details so you can find where to order this. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. And hope, hopefully we can jump on again sometime uh, if we have more questions and feedback from our listeners. We would love to. And I okay. guarantee you'll, you'll love the last chapter. It's called The End, which is really mainly our GI chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wanted to save that for last. Um <laughs> Are there any highlights that we missed, ladies? Um, I think one highlight is um, knowing that if someone needs surgical correction, right, we also work simultaneously with our colorectal surgeon. So again, back to these young women who have like rectal prolapse and prolapse of other pelvic organs, things can be fixed all together. So again, also, if you are a patient seeking help and they're telling you you need three different operations, you know, ask, can everything be done together? And, you know, you should feel free to ask questions. And I want to reinforce what Dr. Scott said. It's difficult and embarrassing to, I think, sometimes even ask your doctor, yeah. even though I always tell patients all the time, I'm like, I just examined your vagina. Like, how can you be embarrassed to ask me anything? But um, not everybody, you know, has, has a urogynecologist. So that's another reason why we wrote this book so that women can have a reference that is accurate. It debunks a lot of the myths, like, you know, what is a normal smell down there? What is normal vaginal discharge? What is normal, you know, urinary and bowel function? 
And really just we're trying to empower women because, you know, knowledge is power. And also when you have some knowledge, you can go out there and get answers to all your questions and not feel embarrassed to ask about them. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and you even do a, a chapter on transgender. So if someone has gone through uh, an operation, so I think that was very um, sensitive and um, timely of, of, the, of this book. Um, again, it's phenomenal. Um, I encourage you all to read it. And I think it's good to take this to the doctor. Maybe you're afraid to articulate something, but this is a book written by doctors. So go there and, and point out, you know, I think I might have this. And so you feel like you're, you're backed by someone, like you have this in your pocket or your big purse. <laughs> <laughs> or your big pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, I think this is a guy. This is to help you. It's your friend. And sometimes it's easier to bring something and reference it. And you know, you're not, it's not put, printing out a bunch of pages from Google and bringing them to the doctor. A doctor would rather see something from their colleagues uh, that you're bringing in. Um, because it's all evidence-based. They have wonderful references in here. And I think this is a great tool to have to bring to your next appointment if you're struggling with a way to articulate it or a way to explain it or understand it. So I encourage everyone to check out this book. Um, thank you so much, ladies. This is phenomenal. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Gastro Girl Podcast. For more information and resources, please visit gastrogirl.com. Do you have a question for Gastro Girl? Please email podcast at gastrogirl.com. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Gastro Girl podcast are not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Please consult a licensed clinician in your state regarding all matters related to your health.